My parents are living a life I don't want to live at 70. Women are really the pioneers of aging. A woman really needs chocolate. Love older women, younger men. Woman a pause. Yeah. <laughs> women who don't have to pause. We, we are best friends. Minnesota Okinawa. We are the Mountain Women of Jackson Hole. To your health. I have prepared myself to be where I am. Having a purpose is the key. People say I must be special to do this, but I'm not special. I just love. Part of my purpose is to help those little things make a gigantic difference. We all have challenges. None of us get through this lifetime without a hard time. Breast cancer is really a disease related to hormones. It's like the play, you know. My mother wouldn't say the word. Anything that you do to prevent heart disease also prevents cancer and makes you live longer and better. It isn't ever too late. Five girls to simulate what an actual jam would be. I cry, I feel much better afterwards. This is why I do what I do. Our estrogen decreases and it really affects our sex drive. The hormone changes, he ain't got no problems compared to that, I promise you. We're not gonna go back to hunter-gatherer, but we do have to make some changes. America's lifestyle is killing us. Age is just a number. The older a tree gets, the more beautiful it gets. It's not really a male-dominated world. Men just think it is. At the University of Michigan's A. Alfred Taubman Medical Research Institute, we're standing behind women as they embrace all of life to the fullest. New Step Ann Arbor, supporting the active lives of women with inclusive fitness products for over 20 years. The area agencies on aging serving Southeast Michigan are a trusted resource for and a proud supporter of today's aging woman. Hello, I'm Desiree Cooper. In the last episode, we learned about breast and ovarian cancer. In today's show, we continue on the journey with breast cancer patient Ingrid Sheldon as she begins her treatment. We're also going to meet Tony, a stage four breast cancer patient. A good friend of ours uh, commented to me, he said, every person is different uh, when how they react to their cancer. I guess I can't say I was afraid. I was just looking at it as something I would take care of. And yes, I would just be a little bump in my life. My first visit with the team, the nurse said, OK. The, well, this is the nurse for the medical oncologist, and she said, now, day 16, your hair is going to fall out. So my husband, Cliff, being the good person that he is, made sure on day 10, I had purchased my cranial prosthesis. Okay, this'll be, okay. What do you think? I think it's lovely. It's interesting, uh, and it doesn't take a real long time, but for one of the two, the nurse dresses up almost, you almost feel like she would be in a space suit. Maybe her face is showing, but she has on this very protective apron and gloves and such so that if any of this chemical should happen to splash on her, she is protected. But then you have to think, wow, it's going in me, so it must be exceedingly strong and good, and I hopefully killing off any stray cancer cells that may be floating around in my body. Bicycle built for two, this is a bed built for two. This is hard. Here. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could do more. Sometimes I wish I could take on mm. some of her burdens, but oh. I can just be there to help and support. But I've got pretty good pain tolerance. She could give me some of her pain or some of her 
some of the things she's going through. My good friend, we're, my best we're friend. Made some plans for the future and can't always predict what's going to happen, but we're, we're very optimistic and looking forward and it'll be 50 years in three years and we're looking forward to that. Yep, it'll be good. It's been a good adventure so far and there's more of the journey yet to come. <laughs> Sometimes I think we have a new pet. It'll be my fourth or fifth radiation treatment, so I'm really, it's kind of nice to begin the whole process and get it going. Uh, so I had to wait a little bit, so this is nice. Ms. Sheldon today will be getting radiation therapy treatment. She's here on her fifth fraction um, for radiation. We will be, she's changing right now and we will bringing her in shortly to the treatment room. Ms. Sheldon. They have told me this will be the easiest part of the whole routine to, you know, to get well. Uh, and I haven't felt exceptionally tired yet or felt any burning from the radiation. So they're doing their job very carefully and appreciative of it. In the era prior to when we began offering surgical management of uh, breast cancer, before we offered women mastectomies for breast cancer, this is going back to uh, prior to the 1900s, women were institutionalized if they had a cancerous growth in the breast and breast cancer was thought of as being a universally fatal disease. Many women ask me, how do you die of breast cancer? And you don't actually die of the cancer in your breast. It's the breast cancer spread that if it occurs um, would actually cause your death. Now I would like to emphasize that the majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer do not die and don't actually ever develop metastases, which we call stage four or metastatic breast cancer. I have this patient, Tony. Um, Tony I treated back in the 1990s, a long time ago for breast cancer and she had um, what at the time was a locally advanced breast cancer. She took all of the recommended treatment. Um, she took chemotherapy, she had surgery, she had radiation, she took anti-hormone treatment and really did very well for quite a number of years. I think that having the knowledge that you have an illness that's unlikely to be cured in some women could be empowering. It could allow them to start to think about their life differently and to do things to live that life as if they have limited time. And if I can help them live longer and without symptoms, that would be my goal for them. I was a lot more selfish person, um, very self-centered, more career-oriented, um, kind of living the, you know, career girl thing. All of a sudden you get breast cancer and you get that call and it stops you dead in your tracks. I was um, 41 years old and it was in 1997, April 11th. It was nine in the morning, and she said, hi, this is Dr. Pass. I was right, it's breast cancer, and it rocked my world. I was so scared, and I was screaming and yelling, and I puked. She called me up and told me the doctor told her she had cancer. And immediately, your priorities shift. And I just kept saying, our fathers and Hail Marys, our fathers and Hail Marys, our father, and you know, I just prayed all the way home. And uh, 
when we saw each other, we couldn't even, neither one of us could even talk. We just held on to each other. And, and, I, and I think uh, just by holding each other, that was a communication we needed at the time, it just, yeah. just to be connected. Because the two of us are one, we're inseparable. And uh, probably one of the worst days of my life. And then something hit my head. It was the most amazing thing. And I realized I will control my cancer as positive as I can be and as much fun as I can make it, that will set the tone for it. My children, my husband, my family, my friends, my life became precious. All the things that mattered before no longer mattered. You become humble when you're having cancer and you have to depend on people rather than being the bull that's taking care of everything. And it's the best thing that ever happened. It was my blessing from God. In the mid to latter half of the 1900s, we came to appreciate that the true answer to achieving more cures with breast cancer was going to depend on utilizing several different modalities of treatment for the breast cancer. Surgery is still necessary so that we can remove the cancerous growth on the woman's breast and we typically will need to remove some of the glands or lymph nodes from her underarm area so that we can get a better sense of how advanced the cancer is. Many women will, retry, will require medical treatments for the cancer, treatments such as either chemotherapy or special cancer fighting hormonally active pills to treat that cancer. And the goals of these non-surgical medical therapies is to kill any of the microscopic amounts of cancer that might be hiding or residing in other parts of the woman's body, liver, lungs, bones, and so forth. And it's that microscopic disease hiding in other organs that poses the greatest life-threatening risk of the breast cancer. Mastectomy is still one of the important surgical treatments for breast cancer. We also have wonderful plastic surgical reconstruction options that are available to restore the breast configuration. I think when a patient has the diagnosis of breast cancer, of having breast cancer, their initial reaction may be denial and then disbelief. I think they have a sense of fear uh, about what may happen. Um, and, and helplessness because they're not in control. So with breast reconstruction, we see a transformation in these patients, a sense of confidence when they're restored because now they feel much more in control and they don't fear the cancer so much. Uh, and uh, that's really a, a gratifying transformation to see in patients. Genetic abnormalities can put those family members at risk for a variety of cancers. The BRCA genes are the genes that have been studied the most carefully in terms of the increasing risk of breast and or ovarian cancers in the families that have mutations or abnormalities in these genes. For breast cancer, we have bilateral prophylactic mastectomy available as a very powerful strategy to reduce a woman's chance of, of getting breast cancer. It is the most aggressive thing that a woman can do to prevent a future breast cancer diagnosis. It's not, however, 100% effective, and these women do can, need to be monitored on a regular basis to ensure that they don't have a, a breast cancerous event developing. They put me on four rounds of high-dose chemotherapy. They wanted to create necrosis. They wanted to kill the tumor within me to preserve my breast. It didn't work. Um, the tumor still had, at a cellular level, some life in it. I realized I was going to lose a part of my womanhood. I was going to lose a part of me that was important. And I felt a little sad, but we went in. The surgery was extremely successful. I had a great surgeon. I was on horrible chemo, so I lost my hair, my eyebrows, my everything. Uh, my teeth were bleeding and shifting. I was a mess. I had a mastectomy, so now I have tubes and staples no hair, I'm a mess. And Mike would come home um, at lunchtime and he would fill the bathtub and he'd put me in it and he'd bathe me and he'd keep my tubes out so they didn't get wet. And he would bathe me and, and, and he'd wash my hair, my head, and rinse me and dry me and powder me up and feed me lunch and tuck me in bed until he came home. Anything I asked for, I would get. I need a second opinion, and MD Anderson, we're on the plane in three days. 
I can't take it anymore. You know, I'm just done with this chemo. I need to get out of town. We're going to Vegas. I could not do cancer without Mike. Doing cancer without Mike would probably be something I could do, but it would lose its fun and its interest. It would lose the specialness. It would lose the holiness that we've become. Tony and Mike and cancer, we're all together in yeah, this. Yeah, we kind of are. It makes a couple very intimate. Very intimate. When, when you, uh, it's a different kind of intimacy. It's an intimacy that you really... It's like a spiritual intimacy. It, it is, mind. but you really, I mean, you, you really connect with somebody when you go through this. So the doctor walks in and he goes, well, I'm not going to candy coat this. He goes, there is a mass in your stomach and I think it's your cancer that came back. We don't actually frequently, if at all, cure stage four metastatic breast cancer, but we do have treatments that allow people to live normal, healthy, active lives, sometimes months, sometimes years. I've been stage four for four years and I'm still here. Life today is one day at a time. You know, we make some changes, we make Start some adjustments. A Start a new chapter. Start a new chapter. Start a new chapter. When I miss her, she would be missed greatly, but she would be celebrated every second of the day. Well, he's not as good as the walrus, but I'll take you. We understand how difficult waging a battle against cancer can be for a couple. The doctor appointments, the side effects of chemo and radiation, the effect on the quality of life. But what about women who have to face this alone? Up next, you'll meet Juanita and her daughter, Alexis. A truly touching story. How does it feel to be an eel swimming in the sea? Slither and slew and catch a meal, happy as can be. Remember what mommy goes and gets every Thursday? Treatment. Key, yeah, chemo. Chemo. Mm -hmm. Treat. My mom got, gets a shot, shot, and then the, it tries to get the cancer away. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008. Um, I had discovered a a mass in my breast um, about four days before my 35th birthday. She put them up on the screen and she said, this here is bad. All of this around it's really bad. It's malignant. You know, the only thing you think when you hear that is, am I going to die? I had gone through three surgeries, three lumpectomies before we got clear margins. And my surgeon had told me, you know, be honest with your daughter. Um, as scary as it may be for her to see the wound, show her so she understands. And I did that. And Alexis, you know, at that very young age, she was okay and she, she understood. She was very gentle with me. Being a mom, there was no way I wasn't going to hold my baby when she needed me. When I lost my hair, I was really worried because she is a hair twirler. And so I gradually would get my hair cut during um, this time before we started the chemo. I remember coming out of the bathroom, I had showered and all my hair came out. Just, it was the water hitting it and it just all fell out. I wrapped my head in a towel and I came out and I said, Alexis, do you remember mommy telling you one day my hair would fall out? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, and I stood there and I said, go get your washable markers. And she's like, why? And I took my towel off and I said, because you can color on mommy's head now. My hair started to grow back in, which we were very excited about. Um, and then I went back to work and things were wonderful. I was at work and I was having some pain in my ribs and it got so bad that I basically couldn't stand when the pains would come and they did an ultrasound and had discovered that the cancer metastasized in my ribs and in my vertebrae. When I was re-diagnosed, the very first thing she said to me was, yes, I can color on your head again. And I said, well, honey, mommy's hair is not gonna fall out this time. She's like, oh man. In um, 2010, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer to the bone, um, which is not curable, it's treatable. Um, which, you know, you're terminal. I get to go to the cancer walk, and I'm the team captain, so I always keep mommy going, and we always have fun. We get to blow up water balloons, and I get to get people with them. My husband and I, we have been together since we were, I was 19, he was 18. 
Um, and, you know, he, he disconnected um, from the time of my diagnosis. You know, going through the first surgery and the second surgery and the third surgery, it was kind of like he just wasn't there. And I thought, okay, the first time, the second time, the third time, I'm like, there's no reason for it. And so it became much more difficult. Um, he didn't go to appointments with me. He moved out a year ago, January. Right now, it's me and Alexis. She has to carry around these worries and, you know, almost like, a, like baggage that no child should have to carry around. I was putting her socks on and she said, Mommy, she's like, when you die, who's going to do this? Who's going to help me? You know, and it, an eight-year-old shouldn't have to worry about that stuff. They said, you know, the very, at the very beginning, it was going to be a year, and it was going to be hard. And my thought was, I'm going to make this the best year of Alexis's life. She was my only focus in making her happy and making her feel safe and secure and, and not being fearful of cancer. There were so many days, even now, that I just want to come home and curl up on the couch and feel sorry for myself. Um, but I can't, I need to live. I need to live every day to the fullest and, you know, make the best out of the time that I do have here. These are the power discs. Okay, so what do we do with them? This is, you get to change the world. You know how when we're watching our shows and stuff? Mm -hmm. The mom always dies. The mom always dies. The mom always dies. Can't they just make the dad die? <laughs> well, we don't want the dad to die either, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of odd. So if you've been diagnosed with an illness like cancer and you don't have a partner at the moment, you are not alone. You may think you're alone, but you're not. First, I would strongly encourage you to find a support group out there. You'd be amazed at how many groups out there are just for you. The advocacy community has accomplished incredible uh, advances, improvements. Um, they have altered the direction of research. They've altered the way women look at their bodies and the way women perceive their breasts when they are making decisions about breast cancer treatment. We have advocacy organizations in literally every corner of the world. Soon, you will be taking the first steps of your Susan G. Coleman three day. And you will provide helping hands and strong shoulders for others. Let yourselves be present every step of the way. That open road has your name on it. We got this. Got it. Blisters are better than chemo. have driven a lot of the advances that we've made in breast cancer management. They've driven this by making women's feelings known and making women's feelings known in a very aggressive, appropriately aggressive fashion. It's good to know that in today's society, a woman does not have to face the breast cancer diagnosis alone. There are support groups, there are cancer walks, there are online forums, and many community resources. All of these can make that journey just a little bit easier. In episode four, we're gonna learn about the often complicated relationships between men and women. I'm Desiree Cooper. Be sure to tune in next week and make sure you have that man in your life watch with you.
At the University of Michigan's A. Alfred Taubman Medical Research Institute, we're standing behind women as they embrace all of life to the fullest.